Welcome back to Senate Education. We're going through a new draft, pretty close to our final draft of the library bill, 1.2. Draft 1.2. And I think if you would take us through it all, um, you don't mind, this is our final, maybe close to final walkthrough. Do you mind sort of taking us line by line a little bit? Absolutely, yeah. Good afternoon, Tucker Anderson, Legislative Council. You have in front of you the committee's amendment to S220. We're going to be working through draft 1.2, starting in section one. Sections one and two are going to relate to the selection and pension of library materials. Section one amends 22 BSA, section 67, uh, to state that one of the goals is to ensure that Vermont libraries protect and promote the principles of free speech, inquiry, discovery, and public accommodation. It is necessary that the trustees, managers, or directors of free public libraries adopt policies that comply with the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution and state and federal civil rights and anti-discrimination laws. This is an expression of intent for purposes of the chapter that Section 67 sits in to describe the need for the policies at the free public libraries. Moving into section two. I have a question. Yeah, please. Yeah. To that, but should we wait till? I know. Go ahead. Yeah. Let's just tell us where, where you're at. Where you're well, so I did have um, school libraries reshuffling. Mm -hmm. I think this is, would this be where we add it? Certainly so, could add it here. Okay. We would likely need to call out what school libraries are captured because uh, within this chapter, the term public library is defunct. Um, they just would like a school library material selection policy explicit in 220 if possible. Um, so, and I can share the language with Dr. Mr. Anderson, okay. if that's okay with you all. Would you like me to read it right now? Yeah, why don't you read it and right. see what it says. So, um, it would add to uh, chapter 1624 of mm -hmm. BSA. Section 1, 16 BSA. Um, section, wait, I'm sorry, it's the lingo is still something I have a hard time with. Subsection 1624. <laughs> Thank you, Sandra. I'm she. Sorry. And All right, let's just forget about that. Um, each school board and each approved independent school shall develop, adopt, ensure the enforcement of and make available in the manner described under subdivision 5631 of this title, a library material selection policy and procedures for the reconsideration of materials. The policy and procedures shall affirm the importance of intellectual freedom and be guided by the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, the American Library Association's Freedom Bill of Rights, Library Bill of Rights, and Freedom to Read Statement, and Vermont's Freedom to Read Statement. So this is just kind of codifying. And does that mean we have to take testimony from all the D's on this now? <laughs> Only because we really should vote it tomorrow. Right. I'm not opposed. It's going down the hall for a while. I'm not opposed to it being amended mm -hmm. along the way. But I, I mean, can we hold up by include, not including it right this second? Sure. We'll just keep, I think, now we sort of know what the issue is, see how controversial it is. I don't think it's controversial at all, but. Ms. Del Nero, do you want to say something about this? Sure. Um, I think that this is something the department would support, but using the same language that is in place for the public libraries, which covers the same principles. Okay. Um, the department's not supportive of listing nonprofit entities outside the state that uh, can change their policies. So and did that list nonprofit entities? The, 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 the school library, oh, the school oh, library okay. proposed language. Uh, which I know came directly from the school librarians, but the department would recommend that we refer to existing laws and not to the Bill of Rights, just because it has changed over the years mm -hmm. and it's more proactive in the opinion of the working group and the department to go with the the principles of intellectual freedom that are specific to the First Amendment and the public accommodation law in Vermont and the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So you would suggest small c just incorporating our public and independent schools into that language, correct? Using the same language in the appropriate place. It's a little tricky because the collection development retention section, I think, falls in the public library subsection, probably not referring to those 
sections and subsections properly, but it falls in the public library area. And I think that uh, Ledge Council would be able to point us to a, a place to put the school. And, and I would say, why not academic libraries that are publicly funded as well? We're talking about school. I totally get it. I'm pumped. I get it. It just means UVM, everybody comes in. I'm just a little worried that we're getting late. And I almost would rather have people work on it and we can amend it in a probes or on the floor, if that's okay, so I do it. That's totally fine. Um, just thinking about ABIC, they're all going to have to come in and say, we're going to get into the universities. And so I'd say just hold for now. If Senator Dulek wants to work on support and language, then we can bring it down to a probes. Does okay. that feel okay? Yeah, that's, a, okay. that's fine. Thank okay. you. But still within this subject area, moving into section two, this adds a new section 69 to title 22, governing the selection and reconsideration of library materials at the free public libraries. The public library shall adopt a policy for the selection and reconsideration of library materials that complies with the First Amendment, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and state laws prohibiting discrimination in places of public accommodation. So that's the mandate that a policy needs to be adopted that's compliant with state and federal law. And then the next sentence is discretionary. Public library may adopt as its policy a model policy adopted by the Department of Libraries. And uh, se section three in the bill is introduced. And in draft 1.1 was that section 606. But as you will see when we get to the end of the bill, I put all of the department's authority that was scattered throughout the bill in one place at the end. So we'll touch on that in the last section. If you are ready, we're on page two, by the way, section three. This is the confidentiality of library records for minors. The amendment is in 22 VSA section 172, subdivision B4. It lowers the age from 16 to 12. And that, someone just remind me, since I think I'm just strong for it, that is current policy coming out of it's consistent with other policy that health and welfare. I know you, that's on the books now in terms of what. Uh, but I'm just wondering first from Ledge Council, the 12 wasn't just pulled out of the air. What is it kind of aligning with? It's 18 VSA 426. Is he right? I believe that well, the senator is correct. And uh, yeah. Totally. Yeah, yeah, Matt. <laughs> totally. Like, totally. I'm totally. Yeah. It's like, yeah, that's impressive. Yeah. Or a stick to our yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. There are, there are actually, I think, two statutes in Title 18 where care can be acquired starting at the age of 12. And the reason that this age is here is not directly because of those statutes, but because this was the age reviewed by the working group as the appropriate age for confidentiality of records specifically in this case from public libraries school libraries are separate and are governed by federal law specifically for parental and guardian access to library records under for oh no no anything else on that right now okay oh, safety Public safety. Uh, this section amends 13 VSA section 1702 uh, to add public libraries to a list of locations within the criminal threatening statute. So a person who commits criminal threatening uh, and that is making a threat that places any person in reasonable apprehension that death, serious bodily injury, or sexual assault will occur at in this case, we have page three, a public library shall be imprisoned not more than two years to find not more than $2,000. Uh, this covers the gap between public libraries that are municipal buildings that are already covered by the statute and public libraries that would not be considered municipal buildings because they are association libraries that are publicly funded but are not municipal facilities. Okay, the vice chair of the judiciary, I'm wondering because clearly, since it we're pulling public libraries in, you guys will likely want to see it, have to see it. Uh, 
how long you think. Well, I mean, it is. I mean, you know the room there better than I. It is changing a crime. Yeah. Uh, so there's. I mean, I, I feel like it's so. There's a part of me that wants to say it's fine, but I don't want to overstep with, yeah. with the chairman. Right. So, like, think. so we can keep it in and exactly. it may go down the hall after. Uh, this might make a couple of steps. I got, a, I got a problem with polling place, except that, from a constitutional standpoint, except a lot of polling places are schools. So, well, polling place, know, right. That already takes that into consideration. Well, I appreciate the comment. Polling places are current law, right? That is yeah, so we are only adding okay. public libraries. Okay. But, um, yeah. Okay, Dis disregard. No, yeah, okay, no, that's fine. Please go ahead. Uh, the next sections are the library governance sections. There were four of them in the bill is introduced. This has been pared down to two sections that are going to amend specifically the governance models in statute for trustee libraries and managed and directed libraries overseen by boards. Uh, the two sections that dealt with the establishment and appropriations for municipal libraries uh, pulled out because the only remaining amendments that were in the bill were very minor technical corrections and it didn't fit within this section anymore. If the committee has a desire to go back and technically correct those sections, I can put them back in. But you had removed the substantive policy decision around the appropriations for municipal libraries. So Section 5, amends 22 VSA Section 105, so that this will now read, most of this is existing law, by the way, this is just clarifying this, that the trustees, managers, and directors shall, and in the new subdivisions 2 to 4, adopt bylaws and policies governing the operation of the library, establish the budget, hold regular meetings, and ensure compliance with the terms of any funding, grants, or bequests. This language reflects what exists in the next statute to get into governing trustees. So we're there now, page four, section six, amends 22 BSA, section 143. Uh, in subsection A, language is moved into this subsection from later on in section 143, stating that when trustees are first chosen, they shall be elected or appointed to staggered terms. Subsection B, subdivisions one through six. The Board of Trustees shall have the power to manage any property that shall come into the hands of the municipality by gift, purchase, devise, or request, adopt policies governing the operation of the library, establish a library budget, hold regular meetings, and ensure compliance with the terms of any funding grants requests. Same language that you saw before. Subsection C, there's clarification here. There has been conflict in the past between who has authority over library directors at these libraries. We are on line 12 in subsection C, it's on page 5. So, absolutely. Okay. So, a line here library director shall be under the supervision and control of the library board of trustees. This clarifies moving forward that this is a position that is under the library board not the legislative body of the municipality. Okay. All right, moving into the section of the Department of Libraries. These discrete pieces of authority were scattered throughout the bills introduced and in the last draft you saw. Mm -hmm. So for ease of seeing what the, the department's gonna be doing moving forward, I put them all together in section seven. This amends 22 VSA, section six. six. To amend first, we're on page six now, subdivision five states that the department shall provide a continuing education program for a certificate of public librarianship and shall conduct seminars, workshops, and other programs to increase the professional competence of librarians in the state. As we discussed in the bill is introduced, this certificate and public librarianship program already exists. This these are continuing education and professional development programs that the department is already offering. 
Okay. Subdivision eight, a duty is struck, and that is the duty for the department to be the primary access point for state information. And Ms. Del Nato, that's because it just, what did you say? When you testified on this section, it was not happening. It's sure. Um, when it's asked on the floor, what should we say? Uh, Catherine Del Nato, state librarian. Um, that duty has been taken over by others within the state. Um, the department is not reviewing all of the website contact, nor is it serving as a point of information or a switchboard um, for state information services. Thank you. Or not. Subdivision nine. This was formerly within the selection and retention um, language. This grants discretionary authority to the department to develop model policies concerning displays, meeting room use, patron behavior, internet use, materials reconsideration, and other relevant topics to ensure substantive compliance with the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution and Vermont laws prohibiting discrimination. You gave your best year language. Oh, the next group. The next group. Okay, thank you. Subsection 10. Subdivision 10. Subdivision. The uh, department shall adopt a collection development policy that reflects Vermont's diverse people in history, including diversity of race, ethnicity, sex, gender identity, sexual orientation, disability status, religion, and political beliefs. This subdivision was reorganized to match how the state curators collection development is built in statutes and religion and political beliefs were added as two of the call outs of examples of Vermont's diversity. And that matches, like you said, the curator, this, this language. I think it's great. Yeah. It's not meant to be uh, exclusive. It's not exhaustive. Exhaustive. So yeah. it's meant to be example. 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 Aspiration. We're going to drop that. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, thanks for doing that. This is good. Great. And then finally, a new subdivision 11 is added to authorize the department to develop best practices and guidelines for public libraries and library service laws. July 1st, effective date. So I, I don't want to close out your question and your thing at all. My only thing is um, I also have to vote it tomorrow. I and then it, so two things could happen. Um, we could do a committee amendment, you know, because it's going to probably be a couple of weeks between the approach and everything. Um, we could also, since we are getting this learning education bill, we could put some, something on that. Mm -hmm. The other thing is we could have the house do that section. Mm -hmm. Or if you really sleep on it, you really feel like you want it in this, just bring some more language and you try to figure something out. Yeah. And I hope that's not the one you choose, but that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever. Language? yeah. Well, or I mean, do it doing it tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, no, I won't use okay. that one. Um I don't see why you couldn't do a committee amendment on our floor. We'll just because like or send it to the house. I will Yeah, no, if we do a committee amendment on the floor, because what I could ask Jane to do. Just hold it. Yeah. Uh, all our bills will be out. And once all our bills are out, we're waiting for the house bills, we could take a couple of days of cure. Yeah. I also think the house would be amenable to adding it. So I think it's probably fine. I'll, I'll do some research. Any other questions on this? Otherwise, we do you need to do any tidying up language? Everything is said, and I sent a clean copy uh, to Morgan earlier. I How are you guys feeling about it? I'm still troubled by what we're all lacking from the supervision. Yeah. You know, we heard yesterday, I think pretty clearly from DCF, that, there's, that there are procedures for to address abusive families. And I, I don't think we need the legislative field here. That's, that's just where I am. So I'll know. Yeah, sure. Right now, the bill, though, it's, it's a great bill. Yeah. Okay, get it. But I just I have trouble with that. Okay. So, yeah. so, you, so you, you'll vote against it. Yeah, no, I just want to vote. Yeah, okay. 
Yes. Okay. Okay, so we'll vote this today at the end of the day. Just if you could just, so I guess the thing is, um, get a nice new clean copy of that, though. Okay. That S one one. Well, actually, if you're not gonna, it's it just mine is messy, no, right? It's I wrote on it, so mine's it's fine. clean. So mine's fine as well. All right. So before we go, we'll vote on it. Unless you think there's something else you'd want to hear from that might get you there, but we, but it's in there. I just wanted to give you the opportunity to find this. Um, okay, I've been listening. I completely understand. I've been listening for two months. But in a lovely committee, it's like if it's in statute, why do we need to put it in? Oh, I see what you mean. Um, yeah. Right, it's in statute related to health and welfare laws. This would expand it to public. We'll vote it later. Yeah, I was going to add, I miscount, I was misunderstanding calendars earlier with uh, 191. I'm fine with voting on it today. Presenting it all before the day we get back. Yeah, I misunderstood the notice. Great, thing. great. So we'll do that also. Okay. So again, yeah, notice tomorrow. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. Great. Thanks so much, Doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you, uh, Ms. Del Neo. You're going to get that trophy. Seriously, oh, that yeah. was a huge help. I would really love the trophy. Yeah. I the honor of thinking about that. Not today, but at some point. <laughs> Thank one. you. I mean, let's take five minutes before the Attorney General comes in. Welcome back to Senate Education. Uh, nice to see you, uh, Attorney General Clark. Uh, just to set the table a little bit, we have uh, S-20 is a an evolving document. And by that, uh, I mean, we have asked the University of Vermont to pull together a number of different stakeholders to bring back a draft that we'll see at probably during the week of town meeting, and then we'll take it up during the last week prior to crossover, um, where hopefully all of the parties will be on the same page. So, um, because we do want to move something uh, this biennium. So with that, we would love and certainly welcome your general thoughts and feelings on the issue. And, and uh, so the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much for having me. And I'm very sorry that I'm not there in person. Um, um, motherhood Everybody calls. always says that, but we don't know if we believe it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I believe it. I do, I do prefer to testify, especially in person, um, and wish that I were with you today. Um, I will be sending you some like written testimony that doesn't, that kind of goes into a little bit more detail on the various sections. Um, but I just, I asked to come and speak to you on this issue. I think it's really important and I wanted to just share our perspective. First, mm -hmm. let me say um, that I, I learned a lot when I ran for office, when you run for statewide office and you have to go all over the place and talk to people. And of course, I, like, like all politicians, I had a stump speech and my stump speech, like one of the first things I said in it was because I was the first woman running for attorney general on the democratic ticket. I said that no, no woman um, no attorney general had known before what it's like to walk to your car in a dark parking lot, holding your keys in that special way that all women know. And I just thought this was a good line for my stump speech. But what I learned when I ran, when I went around Vermont is that it resonated with both men and women who said, I, I knew that you were my candidate the minute I heard that. And for men, it resonated because it was such a foreign concept. And for women, because they knew exactly what I was talking about. I have kept that with me that that knowledge that I that I acquired of how how gendered the issue of of safety can be for us. And um, we know that and I know this was previously said, it bears repeating that when it comes to sexual violence, uh, women 18 to 24 are four times more likely than other age groups to experience sexual violence. And we know that this council was created because the voices of people and probably especially women in that age group demanded that something be done. So I think that um, we have this opportunity 
all of us who are working on this bill to honor their voices and and make steps in a direction that um, removes this culture of silence from campuses on this issue and tries to do better because all people, especially in college, deserve to be safe and feel safe. Um, the idea that young people arrive at college and are vulnerable in this way is um, unpalatable. And I'm, I'm just really glad to see the work being done. And I especially applaud the colleges who are um, you know, coming with the spirit of collaboration and humility um, in spite of the fact that college campuses are the setting of these violent crimes. And um, I think that all of us working together are gonna to create um, progress for students and all of us, um, but especially for those in that age group. So it's it's really um, wonderful to be a part of that work. So in brief, I I support the bill. Um, I wanted to make sure you know you knew that I from the sidelines was watching this bill and cared a lot about it. And I, I wanted to come in and tell you that um, I. I think it, one thing that I've tried to do as attorney general is elevate voices that aren't always heard. And, and we're fortunate we heard the voices back in whenever that was um, who were protesting and telling us that they wanted more and better for them. And it feels good to be at this point in the process so close to putting in place some of the changes that are gonna make a difference on Vermont campuses. Thank you. and I want to uh, publicly recognize Senator Hashim for putting the bill in uh, and for following up on it this year. You know, work was done in the summer, people got together, but sometimes when we come back, certain things of uh, when you're a committee member or chair can get lost in the shuffle. And he brought it uh, back out and put it at the forefront of our work. And I'm feeling now uh, that we're going to leave with something this year. So I just want to recognize him having uh, done that. Thanks. So, yeah. So. Anything else, Madam Attorney General, at this point? No, I would just say thanks again for having me um, today. Sorry, I, I'm not in person, and I appreciate the opportunity to um, share the perspective. Great. And what we'll do is uh, during town meeting, we will work to get you a copy of the bill as, you know, the, the reworked version yep. that everybody's come together and worked on so that hopefully maybe the Wednesday or Thursday when we're back, we can we can vote that out and get it to the floor. That's wonderful. Yeah, we'll look for that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Oh, any questions for the attorney general before she goes? That look good. Okay, that's great. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Thanks, okay, so uh, thanks again. I think we're going to be good on this. And uh, yeah, it's, it's important. It is a uh, great step. So that took a little, that was a little shorter than I thought. So uh, can we work to get Cassandra Ryan and Matt Musgrave in sooner rather than later, Lindsay? Is that possible? Uh, Cassandra is with us online already. Great. And uh, Matt, I... I oh, you good? Oh, okay. So we continue? Okay. Uh, why don't we go off for a minute? Welcome back to Senate Education. And Ms. Ryan, welcome to Senate Education. It's so nice to see you. Thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, we are shifting gears to uh, our, you know, we have a draft of the miscellaneous education bill that we are going to add a, some other things to, but you are seeing draft 3.1. Um, and I believe, well, I know Mr. Musgrave is here to talk about school construction contracts. Uh, and are you here for the same as Ryan? I am. I'm actually here um, for a couple of things this afternoon. My understanding is I'm here for the public bid law. Okay, uh, Ms. Ryan, we can't, hold on, we, we can't hear you, so we're going to turn up the volume. Okay. Okay, Great. try it now. Uh, yes, so Cassandra Ryan, Director of Regulatory Compliance from the Agency of Education, 
And I'm expected to discuss today the uh, proposed changes to the public bid law, Title 16559, as well as the proposed changes to some post-secondary statute as well. Okay, floor is yours. And do we have your written testimony? I believe I'm just here to comment on that draft 3.1, which is um, the, the agency's uh, proposal. Okay. We're in agreement with that proposal. So the That's idea, uh, do, would you like me to start or? Yes, please. If you would move a little closer to your microphone, we okay. still don't hear you that well. Okay. Please do tell me if you don't, if there's anything. We still do not hear. hear you that well. <laughs> One second. Yeah. <laughs> Did adding the headphones help? Yes. Yeah. That's better. Oh, good. Okay. We learn. We're still learning. <laughs> All right. So, yes, we're excited to talk about the public bid law today um, and to see if there's any uh, questions about some proposed changes that might alleviate some of the burden that our districts are under right now as they're trying to um, properly procure their services according to the state law, but also to make sure we can secure competition um, uh, to make those bids competitive. So there were a couple of changes uh, to 559 that we thought would, would would really represent some improvements and recognize today versus, um, you know, it's been a while since some of this has been reviewed. A few years ago, there was a threshold change to Section A that was, uh, that was a great change and we thought it was appropriate at the time, but Section B was not changed. So that holds still steady as defining a high cost construction project at $500,000 which I wish I could tell you that was a high cost construction project, but nowadays it just doesn't buy that much. Um, and so I was active in the school construction program at the agency back in the like 2006 era and 500,000 did buy us a lot more. Now um, it's, it's very unlikely to even buy you an HVAC improvement project. So 500,000 is just not considered a high cost construction project. Accompanying a high cost construction project is a lot of complications and delays and costs. And what we are finding um, in today's bid climate is that prospective bidders just aren't that interested in working with school districts on these projects. Right now with all the uh, emergency funding that's come into the state at the federal level, there's just a lot of money being spent on construction and bidders just don't seem that interested in putting in the extra work of working with a school district when they can take on a similar project, similar amount, with a lot less investment in that upfront bidding process. Um, so we just felt it was time to maybe, uh, you know, to, to see if there was uh, the ability to more accurately represent what we think is a high cost construction project. Um, and 2 million certainly seems a more reasonable number. Although, as I said, I, I regret that I have to say that 500,000 is not a high cost construction, right? But it just simply isn't in today's world. So that was the first part of it. Um, I'm happy to go in further if you'd like me to, to discuss the extra work or the burden on bidders uh, that do trigger a high cost construction project, would that be helpful? Committee? Um, I'm just wondering if this testimony will completely uh, be uh, in line with or will be redundant to Mr. Musgrave's te uh, testimony? Or maybe? Okay. Yes, go ahead then. Oh, yeah. Okay. Go ahead, please. Okay, so when you do, when a school district does trigger a project that is over $500,000 and the nature of that project is construction, it triggers what we call pre-qualification requirements, meaning that bidders have to submit 60 days prior to a bid opening, interested parties have to submit a pre-qualification statement. Um, that's a lot of work for them. Uh, it has to be submitted on a particular format. It has to include all of the information. The intent of it obviously is consumer protection to some degree, because these are public dollars. So we wanna make sure that the interested bidders when we get to that point are able to handle the project. 
Uh, but it is a lot of work for them to put that proposal together. There's also the significant time delay of the 60-day requirement for that prequal process. What we're finding, at least in the last few years, where we've seen this boon of construction in our school districts for those projects like HVAC projects or uh, security projects, things that are in line with the federal funding, uh, what we're seeing is that we're just not getting interested bidders for our school districts, meaning we're seeing a lot of bid waiver requests at the agency. That's our trigger. That's how we know that's happening. Uh, what we're what we're finding out as we dig deeper is that school districts are having a hard time getting one bid, let alone multiple bids. And of course, my worry is that if we're only seeing one bid, that kind of goes awry of the intent of competition. Um, it's you know it's a public process, so everyone knows there's only one interested party that's been pre-qualified, meaning that when they get to that bid stage, everyone knows there's only going to be one bid. Um, so. The idea here is, could we on those smaller projects that maybe are not rising to the level of a high cost construction project, alleviate that requirement for the pre the prequal, pushing them back up into um, subsection A of of the statute, uh, so that they could they they could just go out to bid, so to speak, receive in bids without a prequalification process. Okay. Any questions on that? Again, I, I don't know what level you want me to dive into on that. No, I think that that's really helpful. I mean, uh, giving that background as it relates to what is happening on the ground uh, is great, Senator Weeks. Uh, just uh, thank you, Ms. Ryan. It's good testimony. Uh, it's a good recommendation. We get it. We understand the environment. Uh, I do. Um, I do have a question regarding the number of bids, three or fewer, obviously leads us to uh, accept a single bid, given the climate of um, construction, uh, firms available to do work and such. But uh, my caveat is that the environment is likely to change over coming years. And should, this, should there be a sunset in this provision so we don't just keep uh, chasing single bid, um, single bidders to do uh, um, projects indefinitely. Yeah, no, that's a that's a really good question, um, and I appreciate that. I want to just quickly scroll up on my side over here. Uh, so the the part where we're actually removing the requirement to to select from amongst the lowest three bidders is actually attached to subsection A. So those are two separate sections sections of the law that that's the over 40 but not the high cost construction. So in that I can talk about that separate or we can talk about it here. Uh, okay, when I'll we're talking oops I'm sorry. No I'll hold the question until we get okay. Up. Okay. Uh, so for the high cost construction, um, for projects over 200,000, those would, we're, we're not recommending that those would change. It's just the threshold that would change, meaning that once bids are received, because those are just meteor projects that folks might have more interest in. And certainly we are not intending to release the hold of the gate of competition. Um, that would never be my intent. In fact, I am the procurement person, so I respect competition. Uh, I also just need to acknowledge when it's not there and it can actually be causing the reverse effect where once it gets out there, this is such a small state and the community um, of bidders here is very small. So my worry is that folks are starting to recognize that there's not a lot of competition. Okay. But I'm happy to talk about that that section under C where we're talking about the contract award and where we're saying to uh, to maybe uh, we're suggesting to change it from uh, selecting from the lowest three bids to selecting from among the the three or fewer lowest responsible bids. That's a different uh, that's a different section of the procurement regulations here, which is that. Um, if a if if a certain purchase, let's say it's transportation of students, or it might be uh, heating fuel for your school building, it might be a small construction project. It might be a construction project that's over forty thousand, but under the high cost threshold. Uh, for those projects, there's the requirement that a district must advertise. They may invite. 
or they may do both. They may advertise and invite. And when those bids come in, that they must choose from the lowest three. In effect, what that's done is if they have lower than three, if they receive less than three bids, they have to apply to the agency's secretary for a bid waiver. And that bid waiver process is, you know, simply a review to make sure that they are unable to comply with the requirement to get three bids through no fault of their own. And that through, um, you know, through their proposal that we're still able to ascertain that there was a competitive and public process. That also, we've seen a great uptick in those requests, those requests for bid waivers um, on those exact types of purchases, as I mentioned, like bid, uh, excuse me, like fuel contracts, um, those small construction projects. Where that can become pretty instantly problematic is when the bid waiver process actually causes them to lose the bid lose the pricing that they've now obtained. So it, it's not uncommon for a fuel price to only last a number of days past receipt. So they may get a price for bid, uh, excuse me, a bid price for fuel that lasts three days. And by the time they seek a waiver, that bid price has expired. They are not able to enter into a contract until they receive a waiver. And so it starts this process all over again. And we sort of get on this cycle uh, where we end up having to do some special considerations real quick to get a bid waiver through. Yeah, so but again, in summary, subsection C mm -hmm. to line 12 does not apply to section B from page one, line 11. So the three or fewer Correct. Lowest bids does not apply to high cost construction contracts. That's right. correct. The high cost construction contracts, after a pre qualification process has occurred, um, you'll see uh, line 20 if you um, go down a bit that specs how a contract award can be made for a high cost construction project. And that lets us know that after you've pre-qualified, you've had your chance, you know, uh, districts had their chance to sort of look at the qualifications. And at that point, they've said, this list of pre-qualified bidders are all capable of doing the work that we need done. They're responsible. They have experience. Um, they've met all of our pre-qualification criteria. So at that point, it really does come down to price. And in fact, they're required to choose the lowest bidder unless those two lowest bidder base price is within 1% of each other, and then they could choose from the lowest two bidders. So there's a little different handling between those regular over 40,000 procurements and then that high cost construction. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we just we just don't have all the language related to the- um, Yes, I see and, that. And we, we're kind of like, we don't have section A, which is- Kind of important, but, yeah. 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 And then, so just then another just general question. So you do low cost, uh, you you take uh, low cost bids or uh, yeah, lowest lowest cost, lowest bid versus best value. Like you don't have a best value. Uh, so amount. no, so in that section, the, the subsection A that's missing from from your um, from your paper there, that's for those projects that are over forty thousand, but under five hundred thousand for construction. Or it could be over five hundred thousand if it's a non-construction type purchase. Uh, for those, they're able to choose from amongst the lowest three bidders, and we would certainly expect them to choose uh, the best value at that point. And oftentimes, we do see that we see that they there's no requirement that they choose the low bidder if they're under A, if they're bidding under A, if that procurement falls under A. So if they're bidding under B, which is high value, mm -hmm. not a best value. The I, well, I think the idea at that point is they've pre-qualified. So they've sort of level set apples to apples at that point to say that, um, you know, any of these companies, any of these bidders would be able to do our project. So at that point, and they have a lot of movement in that pre-qualification process. So that's where they really get to add a little bit of their own expectations or their own values to the project. They're able to uh, pre-qualify 
folks using a set criteria of the state board rules, but they can they can sort of wrap around with their own criteria. That's important to them um, to really get to that value point that I think you're you're looking for. Okay, thank you, thank you, Ms. Ryan. Any other questions for Ms. Ryan? Ms. Ryan, any other information for us? I don't think so. I think what we're trying to do certainly is not, and I just want to make sure, is not to uh, lower any bar. I think we're looking to recognize a significant cost increase in construction. Mm -hmm. And I think we're also looking to make sure that versus creating a process just for the sake of a process in, in regards to the bid waiver and the ability to accept any of the lower bids when you follow the process is not that the process would be changing for those that fall under A, but that if a district who's been well-trained in our districts want the best pricing, they want the best value, uh, you know, if they do follow it and they can document that they've followed the state public bid law, they wouldn't need to come to the agency, delay signing that contract, possibly lose out on the price uh, when through no fault of their own. They've advertised, they've invited, they've done the work. Uh, they just can't control how many interested parties are out there. I think we're just trying to recognize that as a, as a bit of a reality for them and um, allow them to at least enter into those contracts expeditiously. You don't mind sticking around. We're going to have Mr. Musgrave join us now at the sure. table. Uh, Mr. Musgrave, do you have testimony? Oh, yeah, good. Thank you for having me on. Uh, for the record, my name is Matt Musgrave. I'm with the Associated General Contractors of Vermont. Uh, it's an honor for me to be here before your committee today for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, I've actually never been before the education committee before and my my old endeavor as a realtor we never came in here and now that i'm with the construction organization we we we, we do touch base sometimes with education and, and we really appreciate all the work that you're doing with the cte centers and trying to bolster their growth and uh the results we're hoping to see will help help bring more contractors into the field help bring more different types of trades people that come out of those programs out there. So that's a great thing. So just real quick, I'll, I'll tell you who we are. Oh, I forgot my second honor is that I happen to be testifying before uh, my French teacher from high school. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> I wasn't going to bring that up, but okay. <laughs> Well, okay. it's funny you say that because, okay, she just emailed us your transcript. <laughs> so you know that I was a late bloomer. Yeah. <laughs> the chair was a late bloomer. She's great. Right. Well, no, so it was an honor, and, uh, you know, I appreciate the, yeah, it's I appreciate the invitation. It's a good topic to talk about uh, because we like to hear about construction school. That's uh, something my members really appreciate. So the AGC uh, is Vermont's largest trade organization for construction professionals. We provide uh, industry-specific training, uh, including Occupational and Safety Health Administration training, that's OSHA, Mine Safety Health Administration training, that's MSHA. We do a number of other uh, job-specific trainings, whether it's uh, fall protection or confined spaces. We do leadership training. We do uh, blueprint reading. Uh, we're working with a number of folks and, and putting together a weatherization program to help uh, improve our uh, climate. Uh, goals here in Vermont. So we do a number of different trainings. We have approximately 200 members. That includes uh, not only general contractors, that includes electricians, that includes people of the industry, including equipment dealers and uh, supply companies. So we really do have our you know finger on the pulse per se of, of the whole encompass of the business of construction. And our members generally are working with the state agencies, oftentimes VTRANS, uh, Buildings and General Services, Agency of Natural Resources. So we're familiar with the procurement process at the state and uh, participate regularly. And one thing that I always like to bring up uh, when I'm talking about our membership is that uh, we're very proud to say that the uh, 15 to 20,000 employees that work within our ranks are earning much higher than livable wage uh, jobs here in Vermont with benefits and outcomes. It's um, you know, I can recall, and I never understood this when I was a real estate agent at a young age, how 21-year-olds were buying houses. I didn't understand that, but now I actually see it. I see them coming into my building for training. They're driving brand new trucks, and their, 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 their outcomes are, are great. So 
Uh, we're proud to talk about that. So we're happy to hear that the school construction is coming. I know this is something that's been a challenge for the state of Vermont. Um, you know, this our schools are a necessary piece of our infrastructure. This is where we grow people's minds and get them interested in life and being productive and working. So, you know, we're looking at the physical conditions of the schools. We're looking at recent hazardous material being found in schools that show that it's absolutely critical to invest in these properties at this point. In addition to providing a safe and inviting place to learn, new school construction would allow the districts to employ more technologies for their programming, but also they would be able to design these buildings to Vermont's energy codes so that they'll be more energy efficient. That, that helps out on the cost end. That also helps out on our, our carbon goals to reduce our footprint here in Vermont. Um, to, to hopefully uh, you know, be a leader for the rest of the country and world. So reading the bill, I only reviewed section one as requested uh, for testimony. And I noticed there was some change from the original text to what we have here. So what I'm here to testify on is the increase in threshold from 500,000 to $2 million right. uh, that triggers the high cost construction uh, contracts. We think it's appropriate. I mean, at this point in time, I. I I don't know when the 500,000 was put into law, but I would get as 20 yeah. plus years ago. So even just simple inflation gets you up to that number there. So, so we understand that the other requirements of the section, I mean, that they already exist. Uh, if you're opening that up to those, the below 2 million that you just go to the low bid, that's great. My members don't have any objection to that. Although they're also not uh, generally worried about going through the BGS project process. And I think, you know, I arguably, I mean, I would support the procurement uh, officer's opinion that, you know, some smaller, uh, some smaller outfits may shun and turn away from those because maybe they don't have that. We, we think the qualification process is very important, um, but it is, it is cumbersome to smaller firms. Now we at AGC, uh, are mainly working with larger firms. Our members generally have a, a, a bidding and estimating department. Um, they have all of this stuff fairly ready, ready, ready to go and generally are already qualified through buildings and general services. <clears throat> the other requirements in this make sense. You know, the process that we're talking about here is largely known as the closed low bid process. It's intended to get low prices without sacrificing quality and the public nature of, of putting those out to bid and marketing those bids makes it more inclusive. So everyone has an opportunity to come out and bid. It's not just you know, not saying any school district would ever do this, but not me just handing business to my, my cousin. And we are a very small state. There's a lot of cousins around. Um, so I figured I'd point that out. But so the process makes sense. While this process has in the past been the best way to get to the best bid, it's changing. The market is changing around us. So where we're seeing uh, maybe some uh, chilling on bidding, and we're not just seeing it in schools. Uh, if, you, if you spoke to anyone in buildings and general services, they're having difficulties getting people to come in and bid. Um, I, AOT is having problems getting people to come out and bid. Uh, because since 2020, when we went into this pandemic, you know, we were able to relatively predict what inflation looked like at that time. And it's not just inflation of your materials. It's also inflation and challenges of the workforce. So we've lost in the workforce a lot. We have more people retiring right now than we're able to bring in, which is why we're here. So always going to be supportive of our CTE feeder programs. So those things cause a challenge. And I think uh, the Department of Ed pointed out very, very smartly that that 60 day period, then your 30 day period, the decision period, and then the construction starting to take place, there could be months in between that. And then you also have to think about the fact that you have different phases that go through the project. Now on a, on a million dollar project, you're, you might be talking about four or five windows in this building. So that's a little bit different than a larger project where you're maybe replacing a high school in Burlington or you're doing additions or full replacements of systems. There's gonna be different subs that you're gonna bring in along down the way. So, so what we're seeing is the contractors have been pulling away from 
this low. It's not it has nothing to do with the qualification process. It has nothing to do uh, with having to deal with uh, Jennifer and the gang over here at uh, Buildings and General Services. It really has to do with that upfront risk that a contractor takes when they submit that low bid. Now I put the bid in, I'm the lowest bid. This is great, six months down the road, I run into an issue uh, where the windows are delayed or there's a, you know additional costs for these things that happen. And as the contractor under most state contracting, there is no nothing in statute or requirements that would require or allow an agency of any kind to, to do an escalation agreement in most cases, possibly education, I don't know. But I know from working with AOT, BGS, and AR, there's no escalation agreement in there, which is generally included in a private contract. So when you look at the private contracting side of things, these, these commercial outfits and, and, and agency event is correct. They are preferring to work in the private sector right now because the private sector is more amiable to different types of procurement. And one that I was wanted to bring to your attention today and not to throw a wrench into anybody's work. I think this is another tool that districts can employ, but using a process of procurement called construction management. Now what construction management does is it, it still encapsulates all that upfront. And I'm talking for the projects that are over the $2 million, um, but that uh, construction management process at the front end still looks the same in terms of your qualification uh, uh, determination, as far as the initial, what will happen is there's an initial engineering idea. So there's a basic, you're, when, when the school districts are maybe meeting with engineers or architects, they're coming up with what that initial estimate of dollar figure will be. And then they go out to bid. And at that point, the under the construction management model, People would come in bid, they'd show what their qualifications were, they'd win based on what that uh, initial engineering estimate is, and then the, the model changes a little bit. So what happens then is you have the construction company partners with the owner, which is the school district, as well as uh, with their designers. So if you think about projects in phases, right? So phase one, you're saying, well, we've got to put up the frames of the building. So, you know, we need to stay within $2 million. And all of a sudden the contractor comes back and says, what you'd like is $2.7 million. So because they're in this process at that point, the agency or the district can come back, work with the designer, work with the contractor, and they can amend the project. Sorry, you yeah. Sorry, I just wanted to ask a quick question, Matt. Thank you so much. Um, there's, you can use a construction management process, can't you now, or is it prohibited? I didn't see that in the law. Okay. Current she's, law. So she's right. not. She, what do you think, Ms. Ryan? Absolutely. It's um, D. If you're in 559, it's 559D. That specs out the, the law for construction management. And then if you, uh, you know, if you're interested, it's... Um, also held up by some State Board of Education rules for construction management. So there's rules that recognize the construction manager as advisor role, as, as well as the construction manager as constructor role. So there is definitely a path. In fact, I would, I would really, I, I should not probably take this guess, but I would say at this moment, with all of the federal construction that's come in and the projects we've been seeing in the last two years, we I would say construction management has by far been the preferred method that our districts are using right now. They're kind of going away. I think the industry is leading them away. I think um, you're absolutely correct. The industry is sort of leading them away from those GC contracts and really focusing more on those construction management contracts. But absolutely, we that that's what we see the majority of right now. The reason I brought that up, that was great. I feel like that's what we're using in Burlington I, okay. or something similar to it. Yeah. We've, we've had a lot of back and forth and yeah. a lot of so yeah, yeah. Thanks. Well, I could have gotten a little farther into the chapter, I guess. So Senator Weeks has a question. Yeah, if I could, um, Ms. Ryan, Ms. Ryan, kind of I uh, need to put it in terms that I understand. Are we um are we migrating away from a fixed price model of contracts above two million? Uh because construction meant way was just outlined. Sounds like we both evolved together to realize what the price is as the project evolves from framing to root, whatever steps there are. So yeah. again, is it, are we kind of moving away from an initial firm fixed price model to something that's a little more 
the construction management model when you're using the construction, so this we call them like a CMC or a construction manager at risk, does result in a guaranteed maximum price at a point farther down the road when the design is all figured out and agreed upon. Thank you. So that means they make the changes while they're going through to maintain that price. Mm -hmm. Not saying you get to phase one and identify a problem, that gives them the ability to get back together with the contractor, make changes. What happens when you do the open closed bid process and you come in and want to make changes, let's say, again, go back to the $2 million discussion, contractor realizes it's going to be $2.7 million and they come in and do the work. All of a sudden, when you start making deductions, on that, you're not getting dollar for dollar deductions on that either. So that's why construction management makes a lot of sense for these mm -hmm. because you can realize and mitigate that risk going forward. Thank you. Oh, Matt, I just wanted to ask you if, do you think 2 million is the appropriate number for the high threshold? So meaning, do I think it's too low or do I think it's too high? Too, too low. low. So this is a policy decision. I think what happens while, it, so while you get into these discussions, you start looking at what the cost of doing this building is. I just, a lot of people may have been over to get an open house recently at the AGC building where we had to recover from the flood. And, you know, we, we did a pretty significant amount of work. I mean, we had about $400,000 uh, worth of drywall, flooring, painting, systems reinstalled. We built another training facility, and it was just the framing of the actual room itself. <laughs> so the studs, walls, minimal insulation, and the HVAC on top, that was around $200,000. That's one room. So when you start getting into that conversation of, I think the, I think the question that we're trying to answer here really is not whether we go out to bid, it's do we go to the pre qual process? And I, I would dare say, that I would probably keep that number lower than higher um, because millions of dollars, it, it are, it's easy to make mistakes if the wrong contractor is decided and it's a lot harder to pull out than go back in. And I, 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 I firmly don't believe that the, the process for a prequal is, is what's chilling the bidders. Um, I, I had a phone call with uh, one of my members, Pete Kelly, before I came here and he suggested this. So, if, if if they are offering this, if this is an option, the market's not seeing it because PCAL is one of the few in the marketplace. So maybe it's a, a question of, do you look at that $2 million threshold and you start marketing them more effectively as a construction management process? Would that attract more bidders? Or do you statutorily require that you go through that process? I don't know. The, I mean, that's really something that's a policy decision. Yeah. Question. Just, did you have your no, no. <clears throat> Can you live with the language as is? I've got no problem with this. I, I, I think it's logical. I yeah. think it's it's appropriate. Um, you know, my suggestions certainly weren't intended to uh, you know uh, what's the word? Throw a wrench. Throw a wrench. Like, but I did. I thought I would, you know, maybe uh, offer another idea for another tool if it's not being, we're not getting the bids that we're looking for. Maybe we look at the bidding system a little bit. I like that. Yeah. Want to give us some of that now on false That would be great. Uh, <laughs> oh, 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 you and I started working together when you were with the real estate folks, yeah. because I remember there was some natural resource and energy stuff having to do with like, certifying houses. Remember this? Certifying houses. When you went to buy a house, there was an idea of proposal A, B, C, D, or F around energy efficiency. I think. Yeah. And I'm still, you know what? I'm still working on that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's it's yeah. still yeah. out there. Um, I'm working alongside a number of other cohorts to get more contractors educated in those building energy yeah. standards. We help you support and pass a bill to register those uh, contractors. And now I'm working with uh, 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 the Secretary of State's office to try to improve oh, those great. systems. <laughs> nice. And uh, yeah, it was an honor to, to, to meet you early on, uh, Senator Campion. Uh, I'm flying on right? clean water. We worked on yes, the training. We did a little property transfer tax. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Um, yeah. So now I'm in the building side of it. <laughs> great. All right. uh, it's great to see you, Matt. It yeah, really is. Appreciate yeah. it. Thank uh, you. Uh, Ms. Ryan, great job. Thanks, okay. William. Great testimony. Really helpful. Uh, and if we need anything else, we'll let you know, but I think we're pretty good with this section. Thank you, Chair Campion and everyone. Yeah. And yeah, please do reach out. Any of you reach out, want to talk more right. about construction, construction management, I'm always available. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that a lot. And I I think I'm going to just hang out in the background, right? Because we're going to move on to post-secondary sometime today, or is that what you'd like me to do? Or I don't uh, see you on post-secondary. Okay. <clears throat> well, that's what I was told, but if that's not the case, that's okay, too. <laughs> okay. If, if we need you to come back at some point, we certainly will. I think, right. are you talking, just so I know, are you thinking about the section having to do with colleges and universities? Yes. yes. Why we're eliminating certain ones? Yes, exactly. Do you want to just say a few words now on that? I mean, what we basically had Again. done in this document was any school that was no longer uh, alive and well. Alive and well, thank you. Yes. Um, well. Okay. We wanted to sort of clean up statute. And I don't know if you had any, I mean, we, we I think, are in agreement with the list. Did you want to add anything? The only thing I would add is a bit of urgency to it, um, meaning that while it may seem like a simple administrative task of just cleaning up the language, uh -huh. there's actually sort of this phenomenon that's occurring that's um, definitely not what um, is 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 what anyone would have expected or hoped for. But uh, the way the statute is written, the name alone um, is pretty important. And what we've seen in at least one case is an entity absorb the name, so take over the name of one of those closed colleges, become accredited with a accreditor overseas and start mm -hmm. an online activity that makes this look like a Vermont college. I see. Um, which can be oh. very confusing for consumers um, you know, so there is sort of a consequence towards leaving those names in law. Mm -hmm. uh, there's an well, there's an authority that belongs to the name uh, mm -hmm. that, you know, and accrediting is not that hard to get, you know, it, from from a qualified accreditor, like a regional accreditor, it's an intensive process. What I yeah. meant by that is you can easily also seek accreditation from a less robust accreditor. Um, so, you know, you could technically meet the law and be operating, yeah. and, and it's very confusing to students or prospective students. Thank you for that. We will move as quickly as possible. I mean, the bill will likely be in the House in a couple of weeks. Frankly, I, I, it's not going to probably be signed until June. No, I, yes. but I just, But I do appreciate knowing the urgency. I really do. In the, uh, some more context around. I think it's context, yes. Just yeah, some context yeah, around helpful. something that most yeah. people wouldn't expect, right? Like that's... Not, no, absolutely. Great. Great. Thanks, Ms. Ryan. We really Thank you. Really okay. great to see you. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. Great. Thanks. Okay.